She mentioned that um, you know we'll have all sorts of things that are really dense that we will throw at you, and probably some things that you don't really want to see. But I'll let you guess what it's going to be in the course of the talk. So, um, so we're going to go over a few things today. We're going to talk about uh, sort of some classical clinical presentations for functional tumors, and we'll focus primarily on carcinoid syndrome. And we'll just bring you through the data on the epidemiology, pathology, and pathophysiology as far as we know it. Some of the subtler implications that we can get into with uh, serotonin hypersecretion, and then a few slides on management, although the data here are a little bit incomplete. So um, a word on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors for the sake of completeness. So there are lots of different uh, functional neuroendocrine tumors that can arise on occasion in the pancreas. And really the way that we often think about this is that there are various normal endocrine cells in the body and there are lots of different kinds in the pancreas. And commonly but not always we would think about a functional neuroendocrine tumor as just making the native hormone that its parent cell usually does. And so since all these different things like gastrin, which makes uh, you secrete acid, or glucagon and insulin, which affect uh, glucose metabolism, and VIP that can uh, cause peristalsis in the gut. These all have sort of characteristic syndromes that can arise. Now, what I want to take a moment and point out uh, what is not on the slide, which is actually carcinoid syndrome. And I did that very deliberately because pancreatic serotoninomas happen, but they're extremely uncommon. And so um, the one thing I would want people to take away from this slide is if someone tells you you have a pancreatic serotoninoma or that you have carcinoid syndrome with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, I'd just like to double check and make absolutely certain that I know that that's really clinically the case, that we have both hormone and syndrome in the same patient at the same time, because um, it often gets thrown around mistakenly. So it's one of those sort of caveats for people. But so the focus today is gonna be carcinoid syndrome. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, it's a classic triad of wheezing, flushing, and diarrhea. And we can eventually see some right-sided fibrotic disease in the valves of the heart that make the tricuspid valve have a hard time coming together. And we think of those last two, particularly the GI symptoms and the heart issues, as coming from serotonin. And I'll show you a little bit of data on that briefly. Um, now, in terms of the symptoms and how frequently we see them, it's sort of useful to note. Now, We've all talked about be careful where you get your data from, right? And so a lot of the series that we see in carcinoid syndrome are single center referral biased uh, series. So um, you have sort of a different mix than you might in the regular population. But I think what we can take away from these data are the relative incidence of various symptoms, right? So we see a lot of people with flushing, fewer people with abdominal pain. We get the heart issues with valvulopathy. And then occasionally we see chest uh, complaints, things like wheezing and cough and so forth, but significantly less common than the flushing and, and GI distress. Oh no, there we go. So epidemiology. So we talk about a couple of classic exacerbating fast factors, which I think came up at lunch today. Um, we talk about ethanol or alcohol, specific foods, and for the, the physicians in the room, this really just overlaps with the MAOI antidepressant list where we're not supposed to have people eat aged fruits and cheeses and uh, meats and so forth. Um, and then epinephrine, which can be brought on by emotion or exercise, but I think to make it harder for the trainees, we tell them there's five E's instead of just three. And then the most extreme thing we can see is carcinoid crisis, which is often a drop in blood pressure that can be encountered in the, in the operating room. Now, because of some of those referral biases, we've taken a large-scale epidemiologic look at the population a few years ago with some of our epidemiology colleagues. And I think the take-home messages that I would want to reinforce are really that when the medical oncologists and neuroendocrine specialists think about neuroendocrine tumor patients, we really think about grade, stage, and primary site as sort of the classic defining features for what is this cancer and where is it now and how fast is it moving. And it turns out that uh, the incidence of carcinoid syndrome globally tracks with those things. So it is classic to see carcinoid syndrome in a patient with a distant mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor. That's where we see it most frequently. And you'll notice these other sites that are probably mid-gut, like the cecum, which is the right colon, and other, which you usually just means small bowel, all have sort of the highest incidence. But 
Um, it's, it's not true that just because you don't have a metastatic mid-gut well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, you could not possibly have carcinoid syndrome. It's just that it's more likely under those conditions. Now, why do we pay attention to this? So it turns out if you look at the overall population of folks um, who fit these criteria in the United States, it actually turns out that patients with carcinoid syndrome live a little bit less long than patients without carcinoid syndrome. Now, it is impossible from these data to be able to say whether this is purely what we would call an unmeasured covariate, meaning this is just a proxy for having more cancer in your body and therefore your disease is more advanced. Um, but it's one of those things where when we see carcinoid syndrome, we need to have our antennae up that, uh, that things can be a little bit more complicated and difficult. Now, in terms of pathophysiology, all right, this is the part that I warned you about that no one wanted to see after lunch. Because if you weren't asleep already, I decided to quote my friend, Dr. Wikipedia, with, the, with serotonin um, synthesis from tryptophan. But it is worth noting that um, tryptophan, which we ingest in our diet, particularly at Thanksgiving, where we get it from our turkey, um, is metabolized through the rate-limiting step tryptophan hydroxylase and down through a couple of other steps that I memorized and forgot years ago, down to serotonin. And what we can see actually with 1950s technology, 1950s, is that as people with carcinoid syndrome increase their tryptophan intake, the serotonin secretion in the urine goes up and then you bring down the tryptophan intake and the serotonin goes down. So this is why when you talk with dietitians about you know, what you may or may, may wanna stay away from or have difficulty eating, they'll talk to you about tryptophan rich foods because we can see that it's directly linked to how much serotonin comes out and is made by the tumor. Um, and this is actually, there are all sorts of cool old studies where you can show the tryptophan going to uh, the tumor specifically at many, many times the rate that we would see in sort of the normal gut. So these tumors really, those that are metabolizing tryptophan into serotonin, they do it a lot, and, and you can sort of see that in real time. Now, just a moment, there, there was going to be a talk on um, carcinoid heart today. I'm not sure if it's still on the agenda, but so I just wanted to point out that uh, total body serotonin uh, does go up with this valve disease. And again, we tend to see sort of fibrosis of the starting on the right side of the heart, and then as things move through over to the left side, we can see valve disease in folks, and that can get diagnosed on an echocardiogram. And for some folks, that's the first time we hear about it. Now, carcinoid crisis is one of the other specific examples that we, uh, that we tend to think about, and probably the best work on this most recently has been done by uh, Rod Pommier in Oregon, who has shown us that in his, again, selected patient population of folks with neuroendocrine tumors, they actually observe something that looks like carcinoid syndrome as much as 20, or excuse me, carcinoid crisis as much as 20% of the time in the operating room. And even though uh, none of us would ever think of not giving octreotide in the perioperative setting, the, the couple of studies they have done with specific interventions, like a large bolus of octreotide or even a continuous drip, didn't actually seem to change the rate. We still do it. I'm not saying don't do it, but it's not quite clear what we can do to prevent and mitigate the, the carcinoid crisis in the OR. Okay, if you weren't asleep yet, here's all of serotonin synthesis. And um, the reason is just to point out that while the rate-limiting enzyme in this direction is tryptophan hydroxylase, the rate-limiting enzyme in this direction, which is IDO or indolamine 2,3-diactinase, leads us down this kynurenin pathway to something called niacin which you can look up by Googling niacin at Wikipedia. And it turns out that we don't just make this for no reason, um, we make it because we need it. And in fact, there's, uh, there's a condition that can develop primarily in third world countries where people are niacin deficient, and they develop what's actually known as sort of a 3D syndrome called pellagra, where they have diarrhea, dementia, and dermatitis. And in fact, if you go back far enough, again, to the 1950s, because um, I am a 95-year-old man trapped in this body, um, you, will, you will find case reports of patients with pellagra from long-standing unmanaged carcinoid syndrome. And so what you typically see is uh, some sort of scaly rash on the extensor surfaces. These are the shins or maybe the elbows. Um, this was just carcinoid flush um, back in the 1950s. Um, and people can have some issues with thinking clearly and, of course, worse, worse GI distress than they already had to begin with from their carcinoid syndrome. And um, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, when you measure this relatively low level of niacin in the blood, you can then give it back and people feel better. 
And it turns out that for some folks with carcinoid syndrome, we can actually document, and I can't take credit for this, this was, um, this was Dick Warner and Janice Paseka, um, showing that in fact we can find depleted niacin uh, stores in some folks with advanced carcinoid syndrome, which is really interesting because um, we can also do neurocognitive profiling, uh, which again, I can't take credit for, um, and folks have observed actually that there are specific complaints that people with carcinoid syndrome have about their memory. And in some cases, what this would lead us to say is, look, these data don't tell me that these patients had niacin deficiency, but we can at least say that it may be worth checking niacin in some folks who have complaints. And again, this can be one of the subtler implications of carcinoid syndrome that we as physicians need to stay attuned to um, so we can sort of help our patients if they, if they do turn out to be deficient. Okay, so what can we do to reduce that serotonin secretion? So I'm just going to go in chronological order. So the oldest thing we could possibly do is just say if there's a lot of tumor and that's making a lot of hormone, uh, maybe what we need is less tumor to make less serotonin. And so in the 1950s, some surgeons recognized that if they took out some tumor, this was, as we referenced earlier, R2, so just gross subtotal debulking, they could decrease the 5-HIA that was uh, coming out in a patient's urine um, and reduce the impact of, of the carcinoid syndrome on their life. And then if we move into the 80s, um, we'll see that with our interventional radiology techniques, and here we have primarily just bland embolization that was used, uh, we can also in this case series demonstrate that the 5-HIAA goes down. And of course, anyone who's ever spent any time with a surgeon knows that surgeons believe surgery is better than anything else you could imagine. So sure enough, surgeons have done series to document that they believe that um, they get better responses and longer responses if you do surgery than if you don't. But again, just alluding to listen to everything Giovanna says, um, it really is all about sort of quality of life, life and risk benefit trade off. And so which intervention makes sense for which person? Um, is, is really the difficult part. And of course, all of that needs to be through the lens of understanding all of the other therapies that I'm about to describe to you, which are not 60 years old. And so the first of these would be octreotide, right? So it was actually, um, it was a big step forward just to be able to give this subcutaneously three times a day in the 80s. It used to be a continuous infusion that you could only get at the NIH. Um, but sure enough, octreotide does reduce the amount of 5-HIA that's secreted in the urine and does reduce flushing and GI distress according and um, with the LAR study um, by Rubin and colleagues and Larry Coles in the, in the 90s, we could see that 20 milligrams of octreotide in that study, these are in sort of the days before power calculations, had sort of the lowest uh, bowel movement frequency of the groups. And you'll notice that's a subtlety between the tumor control studies with Promid that use 30 milligrams, which is what I tend to use in practice, versus this um, sort of pure syndrome control study where 20 milligrams came out. Now, very different style of data with lanreotide. So here, the observation is that yes, you can bring down the 5-HIAA, um, but also that you can reduce the need for rescue octreotide injections with long-acting lanreotide. And so this medicine also is FDA approved for control of carcinoid syndrome, just again with a different style of data. And then finally, our most recent pharmacologic intervention uh, showing you that paying attention to all the biochemistry is worthwhile is that it turns out that if you specifically block tryptophan hydroxylase, which is that rate limiting enzyme in the synthesis of serotonin from tryptophan, you can drop the 5-HIA in the urine and diminish the bowel movement frequency um, for patients with carcinoid syndrome that's refractory to somatostatin analog therapy. And so this drug is also FDA approved in this space for folks who have carcinoid syndrome that's refractory. Uh, to that SMAST analog, and it's used in combination. So, you know, there's a couple of ways we can, we can go with this, and I've sort of hinted at most of them in the short time that I had. Um, we really don't have um, great approaches for carcinoid heart beyond fixing the valve once it's beyond biochemical repair. Um, we don't really know what to do about carcinoid crisis, um, although we're able to support people through the operations. Um, and then, of course, you know, thinking about those neurocognitive issues that may develop in some folks and what we can do biochemically to, to make them feel better. And then I didn't really have time to delve into it, but there are you know, some subtle suggestions that, that this may be involved in the immunology of these tumors. And so as we think about sort of scientifically driven interventions to, to you know, help our patients with the next breakthrough, I'm sort of hopeful that this may be one of the directions that we can take this. So that's really uh, all the time I have. We've talked about classic clinical presentations. We walked you through the epidemiology where this is most and least common. We've talked about how it happens, why it happens, what else can happen that is subtler, and what we can do about it. 
And so with that, I think um, we'll take questions a bit later. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you.